Welcome back to another Service Management Leadership Podcast. I have a great guest for you today and this week, David Farrow. David, how are you today? I am really good, Jeffrey. How are you doing? I am well. I am happy to have this conversation. Uh, your book's coming out. I'm pretty excited, and we'll get into that in just a moment. I start every podcast, not every, but most of the ones that we have first-time guests with uh, the same question. How did you get started in the service management world? It's not something you go to school for. Nobody wakes up one day when they're 13 and they say, you know, I really want to go into service management. So what brought you down this path? <laughs> That's a really good question. And I'll try and keep it, I'll try and keep it brief because I've kind of been working in this area for about 29 years. Uh, next year will actually be my 30th year. Um, but I left school at an early age kind of with little in the way of qualifications and service management really wasn't on my radar as a career. Um, I grew up actually around the UK's Royal Air Force. My dad um, made his career working around the world uh, for Her Majesty's government on, on aircraft and on helicopters. And so the only thing I ever wanted to be was a fighter pilot, pure and simple. It's all I wanted to do. Um, but Really, I neither studied hard enough or, or put enough concentration in to become that. Um, but one of the things I think really helped me become what I am today, but maybe not in terms of understanding what the career trajectory was, is our life in the Air Force prepared me for this life as a service manager. See, uh, we, we moved around an awful lot. I'd go to lots of schools. Um, and what that did is it gave me some life skills. One of those was about being or feeling comfortable in uncomfortable surroundings. A lot of my effort went into making friends quickly, to influencing people quickly. And I think they've really helped with the service management piece of my life. In terms of the career, so to speak, as I said, I, I left school early at the age of 16. And, and I was, I grew up in a, in a small town in the north of England where opportunity would, would normally be in more manual pieces of work. Um, I guess you would call, you know, sort of blue collar. And I was actually part of a, a job scheme to get those of us that hadn't done so well at school into jobs. Um, and I was sent off for interview practice. And as part of that interview practice, it went so well that I got the job. And, and the reason I got the job is because I was asked if I could put together a PC. And it was one of the few life skills I had at that time. Um, what I didn't have, though, was a good listening skill. So I actually ended up putting together all of the PCs that they'd set aside for all of the candidates for their practice. Um, and so I didn't really give anyone else the opportunity to get the job. I, I, I did it all there and then, but it was more due to my lack of listening skills than it was my talent. Um, but ultimately, that then led me on this path. Um, so as a 16 to 19 year old, I did a little bit of coding. Um, I installed networks. I was actually a Microsoft trainer at one point. Wow. Um, but then my, my education came when I joined IBM Global Services. Um, I went to work for IBM on their help desks, and I absolutely loved it. Um, it gave me an opportunity to speak to people, which I really enjoy. And that work enabled me to start working on what were at that time enterprise-focused service management processes. But the only enterprise I really knew anything about was the Starship Enterprise. I had no idea what an enterprise was. But, but that education led to me taking ITIL V2 Foundation. And the thing that really kicked off my service management career is I did ITIL V2 in service level management. And that opened up to me a world of possibilities. And, and, and it really inspired me and set me on the path that, that I'm still on today. It's a great story. So that's why I enjoy this because <laughs> none of us have a direct route. It's always... Uh, it's always a very indirect route, but I thank you for sharing with us. So you recently wrote a book called Co-Creating Value in Organizations, a guide for consultants, executives, and managers. As we start thinking about and talking about this book, what led you to write it? Well, I was asked if I'd be interested in writing something. And to be honest, um, I was so shocked and flattered uh, that I said yes with no idea what I'd actually write about. Um, I didn't even have really any idea of the work involved in writing a book. Um, so I had no concept of putting together product proposals or the endless reviews that go into it. Yeah. So it's one of, the, one of those scenarios where I made a, 
a split second decision or, or at least felt that way but I felt like it was the right thing to do in, in terms of then what led to me writing it on that theme is I've been lucky enough to myself I guess to keep every notebook I've used during my career I've got stacks of the things wow. all the way from my help desk days um, and so I started looking through them you know for what was what was I like what was I doing and they, they they were really great referral and something about my recollection and the notebooks basically said to me that whenever anyone called me on those desks or called any of us on those desks they were never calling to say, hey, how's your day? <laughs> <laughs> it was always something's gone wrong. Help me. And in my case, I'd always try and do a little bit more on every call. So if I solved an incident, I'd offer a little bit of training. If, if the caller agreed, that was something they'd be receptive to. If I couldn't solve the incident, I always made it clear that I'd own that incident. And I'd always try and offer a workaround or solution. And so... You know, with my knowledge of ITIL since, I realized that what I was doing then was co-creating value. I was working with those people to co-create value. And that led to me, um, it, was, it was IBM's largest help desk at the time, and it led to me leading it in terms of customer satisfaction. Now, coming back to the book, I think that everything I've done since then has been leading up to writing that book. So... I'm a little bit obsessed with building relationships. Um, I love to build relationships with my colleagues, obviously with my customers. And what I love to do is, is deliver real you know, positive elements through digital services, because I've seen where it's gone wrong. I've seen where I've done it wrong. And writing the book was actually quite cathartic because I was able to not just say the good things that have happened, but also highlight some of those we've had to learn from. And Another area that's in the book that really, I guess, rhymes around that co-creation of value is that I've shared some of my own personal stories. I've, I've not named names, um, but personal stories that show where I've got it wrong, where organisations have worked, where I've got it wrong, but also where we've then co-created value to make something a lot better. And it's a very long-winded answer to your question, oh, no. but they, that was all that went into writing that book when I was thinking about what to do and why. You touched on a lot of great topics, and uh, I'll come back to co-creating value. But whenever we think of co-creating value, we think uh, there's a service provider, there's a service consumer, and now Adele Ford talks about a, a you know customer journey, and you know in the book you talk about journey together, and I I think all of those while they all sound different, they're all the same, and you know. So I wanted to ask you a, a question about the, the journey together and co-creating value. What does that look like to David Barrow? What does that look like, that journey together, you know, this, us doing this together? So for me, what it's really about is, you know, it, I think it's a, an understanding amongst those of us that are practitioners in service management that we're, we're dropping the IT more or we're adding the word enterprise to the front. And I have misapplied service management in the past. I've, I've applied IT service management. So focused on the department or the provider because I was the provider. And I think what I've learned is that IT or ITIL is just so much more than that. We can actually apply ITIL's guiding principles, in fact, the principles of many other methodologies and, and in terms of ITSM to more than just the IT department. So, you know, if you bring in HR, finance, sales, and ultimately your partners and your consumers of your digital products, you can, you can really begin to build value. And that's where the book kind of starts from. Um, we, we start by looking at the guiding principles. The book is centered around the guiding principles, I have to say. Um, but it's not necessarily centered around ITIL 4, although it's in the title. Um, it's centered around my use of ITIL um, and my use of just knowledge, experience and lessons learned. But understanding those perspectives, in, in my opinion, and the way I've put it across in the, in the book, is if we look at ITIL's first couple of guiding principles, focus on value and start where we are, 
I kind of try and look at how you can do that. And, and, and I find there's a couple of questions that I can ask across organizations that are really helpful in that. So there's, you know, what does value mean to you? Huh. If you ask somebody that question, you can learn a lot about them from a personal and a professional standpoint. Um, and I never limit the answer to that question. It's whatever that person's comfortable with telling me. But it helps to understand where individuals, teams, and even whole departments might actually be pitching for something that they see as valuable, but maybe they've done so in relative isolation. So they're doing the right thing maybe for the wrong reasons. Uh, another question I ask is, and I ask this across organizations, what are your strategic goals? So, so neither of these two are technical questions. Okay. Um, it's about understanding if people can identify what the organizational elements and their goals are and, and how they join that up to outcomes and also highlighting where they differ. So again, with the book, we start to dig a little deeper into, into that and understanding why these differences and similarities occur. It might be an organization comms issue, it might be down to strategies not aligning. But ultimately, the journey for me, and, and certainly in the publication, it starts to dive deeper into those subjects. So through those two questions, you can start to find value across your organization, plus its consumers and its partners. And knowledge management is so powerful. Yes. So how do we manage knowledge? How do we expand? How do we actually make that knowledge explicit? How do we lift it out of people's heads? How do you encourage communication? Because some of the finest knowledge and talent that has that knowledge isn't necessarily um, looking to express that knowledge in a way that we can all use. So, so how do you work with people to do that? Um, even management information and reporting. I actually, in, in the book, go through a couple of scenarios where reporting was being misunderstood and could have led to a team being disbanded because they weren't showing the best version of themselves. Um, and, that, and the other area that I think really solidifies that journey, both within the publication and in my experience, is, is how you bring all of that together. And that's around building, in my case, communities or communities of practice, which are actually focused on value. So the what I really like I liked a lot of that. So you can see me getting excited about this. I enjoyed <laughs> the focus on value because it makes it personal for me. If, you know what I mean? Like if you ask me, what is it, what's valuable to you? I can say it pretty quickly. I may have to be thoughtful, but it comes pretty <laughs> quickly, but it's unique to me. And so understanding that as a provider, but even if you're a provider, understanding that for a consumer is good. If you're a consumer, understanding that from a provider point of view is good as well in that alignment or those shared i won't say goals but that shared vision that shared uh path that we walk together is one that is rarely undertaken in today's world at least that's mm -hmm. my view of it i don't know if it is yours but we rarely walk that path with someone everything's become more and more transactional in our world and we we crave these good relationships in our business life and we are left unfulfilled. Is that your experience as well? Absolutely. And, and I, I think often those, those elements are well-intentioned, Yes. but they're just not joined up. And, and I, I, come, I still remember an era where we delivered something other than digital services, just more generically. So, you know, products, real tangible products that you could hold on to. And that still obviously happens today. But I think once you move out of that and you're not all aiming for that product that adds value, whether that's a telephone, a, a computer, a, a truck, whatever it may be, you start to look at how you can add what you see as value to the things that are immediately in front of you. And, and what that tends to lead to is optimizing single departments or functions, but that optimization doesn't necessarily optimize optimize for other areas of the organization or indeed its consumers so these things are always in my mind well-intentioned but they don't always necessarily hang together and that's the benefit of building the communities across organizations because you can start to find out about these things but but you're doing so um, outside of the fires that rage that you get thrown into to try and put out which is where it's the hard it's very hard to make good decisions in those scenarios 
whereas as part of a community with conversation, discussion and focus, you can actually come up with things that you didn't know yourself you could come up with. Oh, yes. And so I'm going to put you on the spot here. What is the <laughs> best story or best response you've received from that? What is valuable to you? The best. Or it could be any of them. I wouldn't know if it's mm. the best or not. So, you know, just uh, any of those. What's a, what's a really oh, one that sticks to you? One, one that sticks to me for all the wrong reasons was somebody in a senior position saying, um, what value is to me would be understanding what this organization does. Yes. And we had to really drill into that. So this was a person in a senior position managing lots of people. But, but what, we, what we ended up coming up with is there was no real organizational strategy. It was, it's, it was a, an organization that reacted to events rather than tried to get ahead of events. So they spent their life leading teams reacting and there's not necessarily anything wrong with that if you're a fire service, if you're a police department. But even in those scenarios, they have knowledge and they have well-rehearsed practices or processes that mean that they can attend on time and or stop something from happening in the future, especially around the fire service. Um, I always use an, an analogy, which I don't know whether it will work globally. But here in the UK, one of my one of my earliest memories as a child was that there was there was this big spate of um, fires in people's kitchens where they were using chip pans. So you, you fill it full of oil, you you pop your potatoes in to make French fries or chips, um, and if it was done without care, a fire would occur. And it and it was happening. It was it's incredibly common. So the UK fire service and government in order to kind of co-create value in my mind when let's stop putting these fires out and let's figure out why they're starting and it was just people not understanding how to use the product and indeed not understanding how to um, stop the fire once it started and there was a, I just remember this series of um, advertisements as a, as a child that were on prime time tv telling people how not to cause a fire and how to stop a fire if they caused a fire and if we return back to that that person that said I'd like to know what this organization does because i'm forever reacting to things my response over time was let's figure out why you're always reacting to things yes. and let's co-create some value that stops you having to do that yes and and that's where the book talks a little bit about that i think i even used the analogy of the fire in there as well actually that's a great story and one of my memories as i look back over my career i worked in service management, a pretty senior role at a very large firm. And I worked for someone who I live 1500 miles away and fly in every other week with and my peers and my boss were in that location and my stakeholders were one building down. And what was really interesting to me is my boss was like, and was looked at that department and said, well, they're never happy. And then when I would come to town, I would walk across and have, and find out from them, hey, what is going on? What? How can we do what we do to help serve your needs? Because in service management, we don't do this to live on our own. We do this to help other organizations down their path. And it, it's always stuck me that uh, stuck with me that we have to be trained to look, have an, I, I use this phrase a lot, and I don't mean it to sound trite, but an outside-in approach. Mm -hmm. What we do in service management has to be done with the thought of our stakeholders because we we have finite resources we can't do it all so our resources have to be aligned with those we are co-creating value with absolutely and and i think coming back to your scenario about you know that that challenge that you faced one of i faced similar challenges and one of the things that we try and do when we build these communities and again i talk about it in the publication is identifying the potential for real sustainable improvement that you can deliver quickly so mm -hmm. within the publication they're called proof of concept mm -hmm. um, so you look at an area you can improve you figure out what's the cost of improvement versus the benefit of improvement and you decide as a community whether you want to go and tackle it and, and you make sure that you don't tackle too much you don't bite off more than you can chew so to speak what that does is a couple of things. Firstly, it starts to show the value of the community to the community. 
um, because you're improving something in terms of value for them. But then for your, your consumers, your customers, they see that you're making a difference. And then they get on board with the community. So, uh, you know, I've built communities which have, they always start with the IT team because that's normally my initial engagement as a IT service manager consultant. Why, why would HR pull me in immediately right. at least? Um, but it always extends out to those, those teams because they can see the value we're creating. And, and there's no labels around it. There's no ITIL or DevOps or any of those things. We don't use those labels. We use value. Um, and, and I think what that also does is as you start to use those proof of concept areas to improve, you, you, you gain trust. Trust then means that people will come to you and say, I've got this issue. Can you help me with it? And, and sometimes it's trying to you know, help people help themselves by telling you there's something they need help with. I've just used that used help too many times. Right. But, but ultimately, opening the communication channels is is so important, and it works across organisations. Um, and then another area that I always think is is a great thing to explore is to look at the crown jewel services within an organisation, those that are seemingly you know the best in class or or the or the areas that you know everyone's really proud of. And just just have a little look under the cover. See, see what's going on in that service. See how its service levels hang together. Look how maybe the skills that are needed to support it are evolving or indeed retiring. And identify that service as something that's fragile. So it's, it's not broken today, but if we don't handle it with care, it could break very easily. And if it breaks, it might be hard to come back from. And, and again, that's another concept that I talk about in the publication. And it's, it's a concept that isn't my idea it's a concept that's come out of the communities that I've worked with and, and, and has worked really well. There's something that, that you touched on kind of indirectly, and we talk about journey together, but that's mm -hmm. that relationship aspect, that trust aspect, because if there's a service con uh, consumer and a service provider, there has to be trust. Trust mm -hmm. that it's a safe space, trust that my needs are gonna be met, trust that we can, we can solve this together. How I'll, as we begin to close and wrap up, what's one way that organizations or service providers, service consumers can help build that trust as they try to journey together? So I think we, we go back to the beginning. And, and as, I, as I mentioned, this, this is written around the guiding principles. Mm -hmm. And there has to be a very honest conversation when it comes to the start where you are piece. If, if everybody does not agree we are where we are, you're, you're already starting from different elements of the track or the playing field. If you can agree that your start point is X and your value that you want to achieve is Y, that's your journey that you need to undertake together. And then to come back to something you said earlier, if there's a consumer at the end of that journey, so to speak, how does it look from the outside in perspective? Let's not mark our own homework and say, how does it look from the inside out? Let's be honest about how it looks to them. What's the experience that we're delivering to the consumer? And does that, does that really meet the value that we want to create? And if it doesn't, how do we achieve that? And, and that's how the journey needs to start. And once you've agreed that, you, you then, in, in the case that I've, I've put together, you build a charter that keeps you honest about how you're performing against that journey. And if we go back to the guiding principles, that's progressing iteratively with feedback. It's collaborating and promoting holistically. And one of the areas that I cover in each chapter of that journey in the publication is where a guiding principle could apply and how it applied. And based on my experience, so it's not, um, it's not the rigor. It's not, it's not going to get you through an ITIL exam, but it's my experience. And one thing that I've learned as I've aged, there's a lot of things in this world that we have to know because there is a right answer, but mm -hmm. that's the minority. Most of what I do on a daily basis and you do on a daily basis isn't finding the right answer. It's finding the right answer for that situation at that time, which is totally different than trying to find the right answer. So true. Uh, you know, and, and sometimes you need to, if you're, if you're looking into what the answer may be, 
you need to constructively challenge the perception of what the right answer is. Um, sometimes, um, you know, perfection may be the ideal, but it may not be the, the resolution for that moment. But understanding that the journey you can go on can lead to perfection and everybody having that understanding is, is the ideal way to, to sort of tackle that and tackle that compromise. And, and again, the relationships that I try and build, um, you know, no, no bones about it. I'm a contractor, I'm in and out of organizations, but I'm still in touch on a very regular basis of all the organizations that I work with because the, the, I try and build a sustainable relationship that means I can help them out when another scenario occurs and also help them change the journey if they feel like it's the right thing to do to change track because they've, they've understood the value of doing so. Which is great because we all need advisors in our world and we there's a short supply of them, I think, that are well-versed and we appreciate you coming on the podcast and sharing your expertise and uh, talking about the book. Where can people find the book and how can they contact you? Well, firstly, Jeffrey, thanks for having me. Um, it's been a pleasure. It's a bit of a pinch myself moment. I am a regular listener, so I, I gain so much from listening to these podcasts. So thank you and thank you to your guests, um, one of whom, David Cannon, has been really helpful in helping me um build this this publication and, and did a forward for me um for those that are, uh, are on linkedin i'm always on there I'm, I'm maybe not as proficient as you jeffrey and not as articulate or as informative but i'm trying um i have a regular show by my own youtube channel called it's all about choices which um kind of talks about the choices i've made from a career perspective and those of my guests um in terms of the book it's available um it's out now um it's literally just come out it's currently on the um, stationary office tso bookstore uh, um it will be out on apple books amazon and the itsmf will also be adding it to their library soon um and if i could just add one more thing um i'm also a member of the um, british computer society's um, itsm and itam committee and they wouldn't forgive me if I didn't mention to those in the UK that our uh, our conference titled The Games We Play is um, on October the 13th, and it's open for registration right now. So I had to get that one in. That's <laughs> awesome. David is somebody I consider a friend. I don't know if it's mutual, but I very Absolutely. much enjoy David Cannon. And so I don't know if you heard when I, David, when I heard asked David Cannon the story, how did he get into service management? He started his career as a minister and then uh, fell into service management. And I love the stories just because it makes us all human, right? Is It makes us all human and we bring that experience with us along the way. And so I really do appreciate you sharing more about the book and your ex expertise. And so we'll have you on again. And thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Uh -huh. Have a great, great day. Bye. You too.